Praise the Lord, church. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Let's lift up a joyful noise to the Lord. Shout that shout of praise. Thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, God, for your mercies, God, for your grace, for your love, for your kindness, God, because there is no one like you, God. Thank you, Lord, and I praise you, God. I am so, so thankful today for Jesus. I'm so thankful for the blood of Christ. I'm so thankful that we have a God that can heal, a God that can save, and a God that can deliver. So today, just continue to remember all those that's sick, all those that's hurting, all those kids like Zach Carter that's in places like St. Jude's or the Shriners Hospitals. Remember them all. Keep them all in your prayers. And also remember all those that have lost loved ones. Praying for you, Brother Paul and Cass family uh, and all the rest of them that has lost loved ones here recently. And just pray for the strength of the church and to continue keeping this virus, keeping the numbers down. They're dropping rapidly. Let's pray that it continues to drop and that we continue to have um, be blessed through that. And I am so thankful for the blood of Christ today. Um, so today we are starting into a new quarter of the Living Word series called Standing in Faith. And lesson one today is titled Without Controversy. Focus thought is Jesus's identity is without controversy in the apostolic church. And focus verse is 1 Timothy 3 and 16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And I edited a little bit of um, our lesson text today because I'm going to be using some of these scriptures later on. So I'm just going to do 1 Timothy 3, uh, 14 through 16. These things write I unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that I mayest know that thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground the truth. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. So our lesson today is entitled Without Controversy. Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, God, for your word. God, I thank you, God, for truth. God, I thank you, God, for salvation. God, I thank you, God, that it's without controversy. God, that great that you are great, God, that you came down in the form of man, God. You walked upon this earth, God. Father, God, to give us a chance at salvation, Lord. And I thank you, God, for all that you're doing, God, for your mercies, God, and for your grace, God. And I ask you, God, to pour out your spirit, God. Let this message go forth, God, not my words, God, but your words, God, that they touch your people, God. Whatever they need, God, that you move into their lives today, Lord. And Father, God, I ask you, God, that whenever they hear this, God, that they feel your spirit, Lord, and bless the church. Help the church to grow, God, to flourish, God. Father, God, that we like Brother, Brother Duane preached on Sunday, that we see that help wanted sign, that we pick it up, God, and we step forth, God, and do the work, God, that you called for us to do, God, to submit ourselves to you, Lord, and I give you all the praise and glory and honor for all that you're doing, God, and I thank you, Lord, and I praise you, God. You are great, God, and greatly to be praised, God. There's no one like you, God, in all the earth, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> Just at first, I'm going to say excuse me because I feel like my voice is a little <clears throat> going out a little bit here from church, but um, we'll, we're going to go through this anyway. So I don't know about you, though, but I am so thankful that I know truth. I, I, there's only three of us in here today, but I'm sure Brother Jonathan, Brother Nick, and Brother JB is also thankful that, there is, that they know truth today. And I'm so thankful that it is without controversy that Jesus is God. That the God of the Old Testament, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, came down in flesh and walked among us. And that we know His name is Jesus. I get excited talking about the name of Jesus because He has done so much for me. So I just get excited talking about Jesus because our God, he is a promise keeper. All the promises he made in the Old Testament, all the prophecies, everything that we read in the Old Testament that talked about the coming of the Messiah was fulfilled in the New Testament. Every 
bit of it. It all came to pass, and it shows us how faithful God is. It gives a great testimony of God's faithfulness, God's faithfulness to his people. Because us as humans, we may not always be able to keep our word. I may say something, the good intentions ranch, as we like to say, do something thinking that I'm going to keep my word, tell you that I'm going to do something, and I may fail you, but God. But God's word never fails. His word never fails. If he says he's going to do it, he will do it. And he is able, and he has proven he is able to fulfill every single promise. You can put your trust in Jesus. So in our focus verse today, 1 Timothy 3 and 16, Paul, he uses that word mystery. For us, the word mystery means something that is difficult or impossible to understand or even to explain. It is something unknown that we are working, diligently working, trying to discover. But Paul, using the during that time, it was like the Greek words that he was using. It meant something a little bit different. And it didn't mean exactly what we use by mystery today. So basically cutting it down to exactly what Paul was trying to say, uh, bringing it to our new age type of wording here. He's basically saying, guess what, guys? Spoiler alert. I'm going to tell you the mystery of godliness. I'm going to tell you this. Paul is telling us exactly what the mystery was. He was saying, you know what? There isn't even a mystery, but that it has been solved, showed unto you. He said, there is no mystery here. It's been showed to you from the days of old, from the prophets of old. All of this has been shown unto you. There is no mystery here. Everything Paul said in 1 Timothy 3 and 16 had already been laid out before us in the Old Testament. It contained every bit of it. So today we're going to go through what it says in 1 Timothy 3 and 16 and point out where it is in the Old Testament, how all this stuff uh, was fulfilled and show how God is always faithful to his promises. So starting off with it, uh, Paul starts off by saying was manifest in flesh. God was manifested in the flesh is where he started at. Um, this is what we celebrate every year at Christmas time. We celebrate our Savior being born. Isaiah 7 and 14 in the Old Testament. It says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Isaiah prophesied saying that a virgin would bear a son and he shall be called Emmanuel. And Emmanuel, it is just a Hebrew word meaning God with us or God is with us. It was to say, it was basically him saying that God himself would be coming. Then if we jump over to the New Testament, we can see that that son, that son that was born, that son that Isaiah prophesied about name was Jesus. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Now at the birth of Jesus was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take thee unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, which we just read there in Isaiah. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel had forbidden had bidden him, and he took unto him his wife, and knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. God had a plan. He told his prophets of old this plan. And just like God said he would, that he was born through a virgin birth by Mary. And he gave the world, at that time, he gave the world the ultimate sign that God was with us. And his name was Jesus. Now God would not, now God, he would take up residence among humans as a human himself. Emmanuel, God with us. God has taken up residence now with humans as a human himself. 
he would now be manifested in the flesh. So now, so he would know how it felt to be us and show us that we can make it through and that we can live godly in an ungodly world. And more than that, God gave us, God gave us a name. He gave us not just any name, but he gave us the name, the name that holds all power, that mighty name of Jesus. So Isaiah gave us some more information about this baby, this child that would be born of the virgin. Isaiah 9 and 6. For unto us a child is born, and us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. I am sure if we could probably... If we took time, I could probably ask each and every one of you and you could give me an account on how true these titles are for God, how Jesus has been these titles for each and one of you, how he's demonstrated these names in your life. Jesus is so wonderful. His name alone in Philippians chapter 2 says it will be enough to one day make every knee bow, not just in earth, but it says in heaven and things under the earth. Philippians 2, 9 through 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name, that name of Jesus, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Not only It doesn't say here that not only will every knee on earth bow, every knee on earth will bow at that time, but it says every knee in heaven will bow and every knee under the earth, every knee in hell will have to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isn't there God wonderful? Isn't Jesus wonderful? Jesus is everything we need. He is that mighty God and he is that everlasting father. John 3 or John 10 and 30 It says this, I, I, Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Jesus and God are one. They are the very same. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. That's why it can be said that he would be the everlasting Father, because he is Father. He is God. He is our Father. There is only one name. There's only one God, and his name is Jesus. I and my Father are one. Um, and that Jesus, he didn't just leave after he ascended into heaven and that was the end of it. Jesus told his disciples that he would not leave him. John 14 and 18. It says, I, I, Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. Jesus said, you know what? I have to leave guys. I do have to leave this earth. But don't worry about it. I won't be long, gone very long. I will come unto you again. John 14, 26 through 28, a few more verses down, it says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go unto my Father, and my Father is greater than I. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. Then he tells him what that comfort is. He may be leaving, and he's going to send the comforter, and he told him what that comforter is that he's talking about. He said that comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. That Jesus is leaving, but he's coming. He said, I will come again to be able to live inside of you through the gift of the Holy Ghost. So Jesus will not leave you comfortless. If you need comfort today, if you really need comfort, if there's things in your life that's bothering you and you need comfort, just seek after the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you have the Holy Ghost, get down and pray. And pray until you feel the Holy Ghost burning inside of you because that will bring that comfort in that comfort unto you. Then you will have Jesus' spirit burning inside of you if you have the gift of the Holy Ghost. The Jews, they put Jesus to death. He was God manifest in flesh and hung on the cross for our sins. But the grave could not keep him down. The grave could not keep Jesus down because Jesus rose again from the grave. 
And that made the first century church. They wanted everyone. They wanted everyone to know that God had been manifested in the flesh. That, that is why they taught it. That's why they preached it every step they went. To the first church, it was not a mystery who Jesus was. It was no mystery to them who Jesus was. They knew it. They preached it on a regular basis. They got beat and stoned for saying who Jesus was. Today, the world has taken that message of who Jesus is, and they've twisted it up so much that, that now they've made thousands and thousands of different beliefs out of that one true message that the apostles preached. They took that message of one God, Hear, O Israel, Lord our God is one God, and His name is Jesus. And they took that message, and they've turned it into now there being three gods. And you know what? That Jesus, He's just a part of those three gods. Twisted it all up. That is not the message the Bible preaches. That is not the message that's in the Bible. That is not the message Paul and Peter, James and John, all the apostles preached. And that's not the message that Paul preached and told Timothy in 1 Timothy. John 20, 24 through 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Demas, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. Be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed, but blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. The Apostle John, in his gospel, he wrote about this event that happened. And I think he wrote about to help show us about God being manifested in the flesh. Jesus, the, Thomas the disciple, said he wouldn't believe it. He wouldn't believe that Jesus came back unless he sees it with his own eyes. And you know what? Thomas got his wish. Jesus showed back up and he, he said, Thomas, look, he got to touch the nail prints in Jesus' hand. He got to put his hand on the place on Jesus' side where he was stabbed through. And Jesus tells Thomas, he says, it is good that you have saw and that you have believed. But blessed are those that have not seen and still believe. That is you. That is me. That's all of us. We might have not got to witness the time Jesus walked the earth. We may not have been there during the time that he was crucified and he rose again. We didn't get to feel those nail holes in our Savior, but we, but we have still believed. We have still had the faith and we are blessed. Blessed. The Bible says we are blessed if we haven't seen, but we still believe. And you might and we might not be able to see Jesus' nail prints, but we have something so much greater than that because we can feel Him. We can feel Jesus living inside of us through the gift of the Holy Ghost. Feel Jesus in us. So next, in 1 Timothy 3.16, uh, it says, Justified in the Spirit. The word justified in the Bible is used in two different ways. Either to mean declared right, or the word is translated in a way to mean in their terms, like uh, vindicated. Vindication means the action of clearing someone of blame or suspicion. So you can, in other words, you can put it as atonement, seeking after atonement. Atonement has to do with two ideas, justice and mercy. Romans 3, 21 through 25 says this, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. For there is no difference, for we have all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be the propitiation, propitiation through His faith in His blood, uh, to declare His righteousness through the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. 
So here in Roman, it talks about Jesus being set forth to be the propetition for us. Propetition, which I'm probably saying that wrong, it means the action of appeasing God, spirit, or a person. So in other words, it's saying Jesus went to the cross. He died on the cross for our sins, not his own sins, the sins of humanity. God came down in the form of man. He took on the pain, stood in place for us, for our very sins. In that, it demonstrated that God is just and God has to punish sin. Sin must be punished. So God himself took on humanity's punishment. Jesus was perfect. Jesus was without sin, but he took on the price. He took and he paid that price. He went for it to appease what needed to be appeased. He took it on. He shed his blood so we can have a chance at salvation through the powerful blood of Jesus Christ that can cover all sins. Romans 3 and 26. It says, To declare, I say, at this time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth in Jesus. Now due to Jesus' atonement, taking our place, for Jesus taking our place, God is now justified in the Spirit. It is revealed that God declares justice on sin through Jesus Christ while offering mercy and justifying those who believe in Jesus. That is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that they preached. So then it goes on in 1 Timothy 3 and 16 that said, Seen of angels. It was God was manifest in flesh, justified in the Spirit, and now seen of angels. From the very beginning, if you look in the Bible, from the very beginning of Jesus' life, angels were involved. Luke 1, uh, 30 through 33, it says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast, thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shalt call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and he shall be the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David." And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. It was an angel named Gabriel that told Mary that she would have a child. From the very beginning of Jesus' life, angels were involved. Gabriel said, Mary, you're going to have this child named Jesus. The announcement of his birth was done by an angel. Then when Jesus was born, angels praised God because of his, his birth. In Luke 2, 13-14. And suddenly there was with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill towards men. It didn't even stop there. He, he, he was there saying he was going to be born. Then when he was born, angels was there. But in Matthew chapter 2, it talks about Herod was going to kill all the babies to make sure he got rid of this newborn king, Jesus but an angel came and an angel warned Joseph and told him to take his whole family to Egypt for safety. And then if you continue on in Jesus' life, he gets older. He goes into the wilderness, in the desert, and he fasted for 40 days. And when he was there, he was tempted by the devil. And after Jesus, if I love those verses because Jesus gets inside there. He lets the devil have it. He, he uses the word on him and sets the devil straight. It says that the angels came and ministered to Jesus after that. Matthew 4 and 11. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And it doesn't even stop there. All the way through his birth, all the way through his life, an angel was one that rolled away the stone from Jesus' tomb. And it was an angel that told the two Marys that came to his tomb on that third day that Jesus had resurrected. Then at the very end of Jesus' time on earth, it, angels were present to witness his, res, his ascension into heaven and get his disciples moving. Acts 1, uh, 10 through 11. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white peril, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why are you gazing up in the heaven? This same Jesus which is taken up from you in the heaven shall... So come in like matter as you have seen him go up into heaven. <clears throat> From the announcement of Jesus' birth to his ascension into heaven, angels were there uh, as a sign of the validation of Jesus' life, of Jesus' ministry. And angels, they don't, they don't only represent um, 
They don't only represent, but they also carry out God's plan. So the very fact that the angels were there throughout all of Jesus' ministry shows that Jesus' ministry and God's will are one and the same. The angels are there to work for God. The fact that they're there the whole time proves that Jesus' ministry and God's will were the exact same thing. They're one and the same. And even more than that, since Jesus was seen with angels being flesh and being bone just like us throughout his whole life, it shows that the angels recognized, the angels themselves recognized who Jesus was and that Jesus was the one true living God. The angels knew that he was God in the flesh. So if we go on there, it says, Seen of angels, then preached unto the Gentiles. This part of the verse bears witness of what was preached uh, by the disciples, preached by the apostles in the first church of that time. All they preached was centered. If you look in the book of Acts there, it was all centered around who Jesus was. They would go through all the way through the Old Testament prophets to point to Jesus being God in the flesh. Here in the gospel of Jesus Christ and responding to in obedience was what it meant to be Christian. What it meant to be Christian at that time, if you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and you responded and you obeyed in it. The very same message that was preached to the Jews about who Jesus was got preached to the Gentiles. Because it was not meant for just the Jews alone. Uh, which we find out also in the next portion of that verse when it says, believed in the world. The message that was preached to the Jews and the Gentiles, it was also preached on in the world. Acts 1 and 8, here's what, um, what they were told to do. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witness unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost part of the earth. Jesus told his disciples before he left, the message needed to be preached to everyone. He, he wasn't leaving anyone out. Not just the people like you, you Jewish men, but also want you to go to Samaria. Those half Jews, half Gentiles that you don't like too much. You need to go to them and to the uttermost part of the earth. All the people. He said the ones that you called dogs and thought was not worthy of anything. I want you to go and preach the message to them. Jesus wanted the message to be sent to all. When the apostolic church started off, it started off as a Jewish only movement. Started off there as Jewish only, but it didn't take long before the Holy Ghost power made it spread. First, it moved to Samaria, uh, Acts 8, 14 through 17. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost, for it was not yet fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they hands on them, and they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Here it shows it was first there on the day of Pentecost on the Jews. Here in Acts 8, it shows it went to Samaritans. But Jesus wanted to go further than that. That was a good start. That was a great start. But they had to go further. Jesus had to push Peter a little bit to get him going on the next thing for it to take off. But it ended up doing the same thing, starting with Cornelius the Gentiles' household, in Acts 10, 44 through 45. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word, and they of the circumcision, the Jews which believed, were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles, those dogs of that time, that's what they called them, was also poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. It started with the Jews. Then, the, then it went to Samaria. Then it went over to the Gentiles. But during that time, the world was mostly a Roman-led type world. The Romans pretty much led most of the world, the known world at that time. So during that time, Rome, which was the heart of the Roman Empire, to them would pretty much be like the uttermost part of the earth. Um, so, and before the book end of the book of Acts, uh, if you remember the Acts Bible study, before the end of it, Paul was preaching the gospel in Rome. And that made it so that people all over the known world, the known world at that time was now believing in Jesus Christ. The known world at that time in their own little land, J Jerusalem, Judea, and then on to Samaria, and then the Gentiles, and now all the way out here into Rome, 
people were believing in Jesus. They were, the apostles were really doing what God told them to do. Then 1 Timothy 3 and 16, it ends with received up into glory. And this is referring to Jesus' ascension into heaven. And if you look in the Bible, other than Jesus, the Bible talks about only two others that were received up into glory. Enoch and Elijah. And not much is said about Enoch, but what the Bible does say about Enoch, it says a whole lot. Enoch had walked faithfully with God. And uh, it only states it just slightly in Genesis, but then if you go over to Hebrews chapter 11 and 5, it mentions one more thing about Enoch, which says so much in a few, in a few sentences. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had a testimony that he pleased God, that he pleased God. And with that being said, it shows that to be taken to heaven by God uh, indicates that God finds the life of the individual legitimate and acceptable unto him. The other person we talked about, Elijah, was taken to heaven in a miraculous way. He went in a whirlwind accompanied by horses and a chariot of fire. But what's great about this is not only did this show that God approved of Elijah's ministry, that he, once his ministry was done, he just went on ahead and took him up, but it also, God passed Elijah's ministry on to another. But it was much more than that, much more than just passing what Elijah had to, to Elisha. But Elisha received a double portion of Elijah's ministry. He got what Elijah had plus more on top of that. Jesus' ascension in the heaven then shows us two things. First, Jesus' ascension in the heaven declared that the ministry, the very ministry of Jesus had been accepted, had been accepted and was the work of the only legitimate Messiah. Secondly, by letting the disciples witness his ascension in his ascension, Jesus ensured that a double portion, that a double portion of his ministry was passed on to his people. And we see this easily in the Bible in Mark 16, 17 through 18. It said, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. In that name of Jesus, they shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up servants, serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. John 14 and 12. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, believeth on Jesus, the works that I do, he shall do also. And greater works shall uh, these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Church, we got the double portion. We got the double portion. Because there is no mystery to this thing uh, for Jesus' people. God came down. Jesus' people know this is not a mystery. God came down in the form of man. He walked among us. He had angelic encounters. He preached. His, his gospel was preached to the Gentiles. And God, he went back to heaven and left us with the power. A double portion of what he had here on earth. Greater things for us to do. And the only way we can get that is by following the plan of salvation by repenting of our sins, being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, and being filled with the power to do those greater works, that Holy Ghost power to do those greater works. So I'm finishing up here today, church. But the work of Jesus continues in us today, just like Brother Duane preached Sunday about picking up that sign, help wanted. The work of Jesus continues in us today. It continues in the church in those filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. We, we are the ministry of Jesus Christ. It is up to us to take it forth. It's up to us to spread that gospel, to make sure everyone knows the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is no mystery. It is no mystery. So go spread the word. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, God, that you're such a great God, a mighty God, that you were manifest in the flesh, that you were, that you came down justified in the spirit, Lord. I thank you, God, for your mercies, God, for your grace, God, that you've given us all this, God, that you showed us in the Bible, God, how great that you are, that we have blessings upon blessings, God, that's laying there just for us, Lord. Help us, God, to pick up what you'd have us to do, God. Pick up that help wanted sign, God, to go spread the gospel, God, to do your work, God, to submit ourselves unto you, Lord. You've given it to the church to do, God. Help us, God, to do your work, Lord, because it is no mystery to us, God, who you are, Lord. We know that you are the great God, that the name of Jesus has all the power, Lord, that you were, that Jesus is God, manifest in flesh, that you walked among us, Lord. And I thank you, God, for all that you're doing, God, all that you're going to do. God, help us, God, to grow, God, in you, God, to get our minds, God, hearts, God, and souls, God, around you, God, your ministry, God, to do the work, God, that you called the church to do, God. And I give you all the praise and glory and honor for all that you are doing, God. Because you are great, God, and greatly to be praised, God. Thank you, Lord, and thank you, God. I praise you, Lord, and I worship you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And church, it is up to us. We are the ministry of Jesus. Spread it. Spread the gospel to the world. Spread it to everybody that you're around. Let them know that this is no mystery. It's without controversy of who Jesus is. God bless you all. See you on Sunday.